Welcome to part three of why the housing market will crash. Okay, so, so far, part one, I shared the Austrian business cycle theory and why I believe that began to play out in 2020. Uh, part two, I laid the foundation on the bond market and how all asset prices are, are revalued based on uh, the bond market, on the so-called risk-free rate. And in part three, I did mention I was going to focus on immigration. That's going to be in the next video. In this video, I'm going to focus on the corporate bond market and why I believe we're going to see that uh, market blow up, causing massive amounts of insolvencies and we're going to see unemployment rise significantly which is going to have a detrimental impact on house prices uh, in the next video i'll talk about immigration the rental market airbnb and i've got a whole bunch of references on that one uh, for you guys and then hopefully we can finish off in the uh, part five video i'm saving the best for last so you do not want to miss the very last video, because that's when I'm go going to share share it all. I'm just going to wrap this up. So all these videos are just leading up, giving everyone a a foundation, um, you know, on, on on why I am bearish house prices, and we'll 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 wrap it up nicely in our last video. So before I get into this one though, I just want to cut to a couple of small little clips, three minute clips each from Austrian economist Peter St. Ange. A new report from Bank of America's in-house maverick Michael Hartnett is sounding the alarm for investors. Hartnett thinks the Fed and its global central bank lackeys are succeeding at crushing the world economy. And he says, history warns the death cross is the last Fed hike which looks increasingly imminent with the world economy now turning over. First up, how we got here. A total of 276 worldwide rate hikes have done a number on the real economy. I recently mentioned how recession has started or close to it in essentially the entire world. Then Hartnett goes back to the 1970s to ask what happened last time. He concludes the magic moment for investors is the very last rate hike. At that point, batten down the hatches because it could be a big one, especially considering that we are coming off 5,000 year lows in interest rates, not a joke, itself a product of no less than 1,343 rate cuts globally since 2008 and $23 trillion of new central bank printing. By the way, Hartnett thinks the break could start in Japan, given they've been draining money so hard it could cascade into a global liquidity event. So why is the last rate hike so bad? Because in contrast to regime fairy tales about wise and omniscient central banks guiding the ship of economy through rough waters, it turns out that the central banks are the rough waters. They are the ones who knock. Because manipulating interest rates sets off an apparently endless series of boom-bust cycles that destroy millions of lives and trillions of wealth every go-round. And the last hike comes in because the Fed's biggest fear during a boom is inflation. It makes voters angry, which makes Congress angry. So they'll only cut during an inflation if they think the economy is headed for a cliff because that also makes voters angry since they have trouble eating. So the inflection is essentially the Fed panicking because of impending recession. Now, so far that hasn't happened because the Fed remains more scared of inflation, partly because the GDP numbers have been holding up thanks to government deficits and government statisticians, and partly because unemployment rates, official unemployment rates, are fortified by millions of people who exited the workforce altogether. Because you only show up as officially unemployed if you are actually looking for work. On the other hand, if you're relaxing on the couch with the Xbox or living under a bridge, you don't count. So the numbers are, to a certain degree, fake. Now, Jerome Powell actually knows that his numbers are wrong. He recently waxed lyrical about navigating by stars on cloudy nights. But so long as media plays along and voters buy it, it keeps Congress on snooze and Jerome can ignore the recession. 
So what's next? Brought to you by Unchained. What's next is continuing deterioration, going by centuries of central bank manipulation of interest rates. Eventually, the jobless numbers start to come up and scare the Fed, and then they start cutting rates, trading some inflation for fewer headlines about food kitchens, trading a rook for a pawn, and praying the media covers for them. Meanwhile, back in the real world, we are lining up for a hit potentially on the scale of the near-death 2008 crisis, which was itself the worst recession since the Great Depression. Toss in today's 1970s-style stagflation, and those cloudy, starred, rough waters could drown millions. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time. A few days ago, CNBC's Rick Santelli predicted the interest rates on the 10-year bond could conceivably jump to 14% up from today's already ruinous 5%. If that happens, we could see something a lot bigger than the 2008 crisis. Here's Rick. The worst case scenario, where treasury rates gonna go 10 year, I'd say in the next seven years, you should be able to see 13 and a half, 14%, Are you percent. yes. Now, if you don't know Rick Santelli, he's one of the strongest voices on CNBC. He's probably most famous for an epic 2009 rant, the rant heard around the world, tearing a new one in the corrupted, incompetent federal government that was busy bailing out everybody on their Rolodex, much like today, in fact. That rant met with spontaneous applause on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and was credited with launching the Tea Party, which begat Donald Trump. Back to the other night, Rick said he thinks rates are going a lot higher because federal spending is out of control. To the point, it is only a matter of time till the bond vigilantes ride again, meaning private bond investors who get nervous about inflation or the government's enthusiasm about repaying their debts. This makes the vigilantes demand higher rates to buy Washington's confetti. Note, Rick is not saying 13% or 14% is guaranteed. He's not even saying it's likely. And he's talking the next seven years, not next Tuesday. But he thinks if nothing changes in Washington, that is the path we are on. Now, the 10-year bond matters because not only are there 6 trillion of them, the 10-year is taken as a benchmark for the cost of capital across the entire business cycle. This is because 10 years covers every stage of a typical business cycle, the boom, the bust, the in-between. If you're in a boom, that means it measures all the way to the next boom. If you're in a bust, all the way to the next bust. That makes the 10-year a perfect proxy for generalized cost of capital, which then feeds into other rates from corporate borrowing to mortgages to credit cards. So what happens if rates on the 10-year do go to double digit? Well, the last time that happened was the late 1970s, when they almost kissed 16% on the 10-year and stayed in double digits for about six years. It was a fairly rough stretch. Mortgages went past 18%. Unemployment almost hit 11% as companies faced extortionate costs of borrowing. And suddenly gold went up sixfold during that period. Silver went up sevenfold. We can only imagine what Bitcoin might do. So what's next? Brought to you by Unchained. What's next is double digit on the 10 year is still a worst case scenario in the near term. The key question at this point is, are we in store for another 2008, meaning a banking crisis paired with a deep recession, or are we in the stagflationary 1970s once again? Or dare we dream, has Washington managed to deliver both a 2008 banking crisis and a 1970s stagflation? A dystopian hat trick they have not managed since FDR pulled it off in the 1930s. If so, everything is on the table. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time. So why haven't we seen unemployment skyrocket yet? Well, that's because zombies haven't yet been put out of their misery. You can see from this chart that borrowing costs or servicing costs for corporations is only just starting to rise. So it's coming. And here from Bank of America, an iceberg awaits with only 10% of the junk bond market feeling the pinch of higher rates. So wait until rates reset not just this year, but over the next several years. A wall of corporate debt to spark recession in 2024. Fidelity 
International says. Here you can see the debt maturity wall that is looming. And here you can see the corporate debt maturing once again. Um, what do we got? 230 billion of corporate debt matures in the remainder of this year, 790 billion next year, and over a trillion in 2025. And you can see uh, leverage loans, high yield or junk, and you got investment grade. So you actually got quite a lot of uh, uh, high yield that's going to come off in the middle of this decade. So over the next few years, um, we got big, big problems. Here, US junk loan maturities leap higher in the next few years. So you can see it really peaks in 2028, but you know, really next year it starts. And from there on out, uh, you know, will we see zombies uh, be laid to, to, to rest forever? I hope so, for the sake of the economy. This is an old chart, but the size of corporate debt. Uh, you, know, you can see uh, triple B. What do we got? Three and a half trillion. And this is going back to 2018. So I, I actually haven't looked at it recently to see what that is. But you know, that's you know, one, one rung away from uh, being re-rated to, to junk. So potentially, uh, we got a lot of junk debt, corporate debt out there. Uh, and what is it? About 20% of uh, all publicly listed companies are, are zombies. So you know, they can't meet their own interest payments from their net profits. Trillions of US debt no longer rated AAA at Fitch. There you go, look at all that. All right, so here we've got our share of all publicly listed firms by profit margins. Now check this out, right? So very negative, over 40%. A share of all publicly listed firms. Their, their profitability is very negative. And obviously that chart goes back to 1960. And um, yeah, that's, that's a very worrying chart. It's okay in a falling interest rate environment or in a zero, you know, ZERP, zero interest policy, um, interest rate policy. Because corporations can just refinance, 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 you know, and we can keep zombies alive. But in a higher interest rate environment, companies can't do this. And if you're employed by a zombie company, I'd be finding a new job. I'd be looking to, if I'm an employee, I want to make sure that I'm working for a very sound company with a very sound balance sheet. So I really want to highly encourage you guys to go and find this video and watch it. It's a 40 minute video. Uh, go to Double Line Capital and find Grant's 40th anniversary Rates Can Never Rise Redux video where the real Bond King, billionaire Jeff Gunlock, goes through this presentation, shares a whole bunch of charts where he basically argues why we are going to uh, have a deep recession and why interest rates are going to be higher for longer. And in fact, he argues that the 40-year bond bull market is over and basically investors that have been around the last 40 years have no idea about the environment that we're going into right now, which is my position. That's my position I have been holding for a little while now. And you guys are probably sick of hearing me say it, that the 40-year bond bull market is over. And now you need to look at what assets did well in bond bear markets. and. Uh, I'm with Jeff. I don't think uh, investors know what's about to hit them. So go check this video out. I'll put a link in the description below. Demand for corporate loans is at 2008 levels. Uh, yeah. Watch this space. Renewed interest in bank rate, uh, banks rate issues. So unrealized losses on lenders balance sheet. Chart speaks for itself. So I just want to cut to a little three-minute clip from Austrian economist Peter St. Ange on the recent job numbers out of the U.S. Last Friday, it delivered a huge job number, so big, in fact, 
that had sent stocks soaring on hopes of that fabled soft landing, the Hail Mary that will save Joe Biden from himself. Sadly, there were so many devils in those details that it won't be saving anybody from Joe Biden. Charles Payne summed it best, tweeting out that the jobs report was, quote, one third poorly paid waitresses, one third poorly paid nurses, and one third government jobs. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln. The report's headline numbers were big. September non-farm payrolls left 336,000, which was almost double what Wall Street expected. The unemployment rate got worse, but at 3.8% is still historically low. So that's the good news, now the bad news. For starters, just 86,000 of those jobs were full-time. Going by the employment survey, the rest were part-time. In fact, many of them were second jobs, which currently make up almost 40% of new jobs. Over the past three months, full-time employment has actually dropped in the United States by almost 700,000, while part-time jobs are up 1.2 million. In other words, people are taking second jobs to make ends meet, and that gets counted as record job growth. At this point, over 8 million Americans hold multiple jobs because they need the money. Almost half a million Americans now have two full-time jobs. So many jobs, you gotta take two. By the way, the last three times full-time employment fell that hard was 2001, which is right before the dot-com recession. Then again in 2008, which was just before the global financial crisis. And then 2020, when governments bought us in instant depression. So spot the pattern. Beyond that night shift miracle, the other shoe to drop was people who aren't working. Workers who are either unemployed or out of the workforce took another flying leap. In just the past two months, unemployed Americans are up over half a million, which is almost 10%. Meanwhile, between four and a half and five and a half million Americans remain out of the workforce. That's three and a half years after the pandemic. My colleague EJ Antoni worked out what the unemployment rate would be if we included those so-called discouraged workers who have given up. And it comes to an unemployment rate of around six and a half percent, 6.3 to 6.8 which is right in line with previous recessions, given that companies hoard workers in the early days. Finally, job composition. In the last employment report, I characterized the new jobs as government workers and DoorDash, and this month kept it up. Fully 22% of the new jobs were government workers, who are, of course, parasites who collect a paycheck to crush the rest of the economy. The rest of growth was almost entirely from services especially government-related services like education and healthcare. The actual productive economy naturally shrank. Manufacturing was down once again, while professional and business services, trade, and transportation all shrank. So what's next? Brought to you by Unchained. What's next is we are seeing surprisingly bad jobs numbers to be so early in a recession. So going by history, it will get a lot worse. And keep in mind, we don't know what happens in a coordinated global recession with $33 trillion in debt paying over a trillion interest, along with a potential oil price explosion on the horizon. They do not have a script for this, but they'll keep pushing until it breaks, so the rest of us get to pick up the pieces. Okay, we'll be watching. See you next time. U.S. yield curve versus unemployment rate, and... I think we know where both of those are, are headed and we know what the outcome's going to be. And here, evolution of initial unemployment claims after yield curve inversion. Um, yeah, look at that. So when that yield curve, um, you know, de-inverts or re-inverts, as in becomes positive, no longer uh, is inverted. Initial unemployment claims, have a look at that. So where do you think it's headed? U.S. permanent job losses rises, uh, uh, rise ahead of recession. So you can see here, and it's starting. All right, it's starting. From market watch, mass layoffs are on the rise in the U.S., at least according to this often overlooked data series.
Bankruptcy. A stunning fall. Major restructuring debt is piling up. Companies are filing for bankruptcy now at the fastest rate since 2020. Bed Bath & Beyond filed this year, Party City filed, Vice Media, Instant Pot, and Pyrex. The list really goes on. And by all counts, there's more to come. The stakes are high. Jobs are on the line. Debt growth. Credit crunch. Ouch. Debt defaults like this tend to come in cycles like in 2008. We're in the midst of a serious financial crisis. <laughs> Or the start of the pandemic when Washington stepped in, slashing interest rates so that companies on the brink could get cheap money. We saw company after company taking on more and more debt. All this access to debt bought companies time, but it also kicked the can down the road. Nobody knows how long the pain will last. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level. The record surge in interest rates is at the root of the issue. Global companies have borrowed more than $500 billion of investment-grade debt since the Fed's rate hikes began in 2022. The vast majority of this was heaped onto U.S. balance sheets. And despite the high borrowing costs, debt continues to grow. It's really been building over the course of the last year. Interest rates have increased, cash flows have declined. By mid-2023, blue chip names saw their borrowing costs rise by more than double to an average of 5.6%, while junk-rated companies were paying 8.7%. With rates potentially staying high for a longer period of time, we could see a longer cycle that may not necessarily be tied to the macro economy. The problem is, in part, that this is a little bit by design. The Federal Reserve wants to slow down inflation. Interest rates were kept higher for longer than a lot of economists and people on Wall Street expected. Uh this higher rate environment has created a mountain of distressed debt. Distressed debt is generally bonds. They are tradable. Bonds that originally sold for 100 bucks are selling for 20 bucks or 15 bucks or five. There's more than $200 billion of distressed debt in the US, and that's more than the GDP of some European countries. Since 2021, this sort of debt owed by riskier, less creditworthy businesses has jumped around 400%. Retailers are especially vulnerable. Inflation keeps their costs high, even as consumer spending slows. By mid-2023, the consumer industry accounted for more than a fifth of bankruptcy filings. Most bankruptcies don't occur because you have a business and it loses money. A business borrows money, times get tough, and when it goes to refinance that loan, the bank says, you're not as good a credit as you used to be, or we don't have as much money to lend as we used to have, or our standards are higher. The hope in bankruptcy is that the doors are kept open, everyone is kept employed, but we're seeing more and more liquidations, which basically means that all of the stores need to be shut down. For consumer-facing companies and those upstream supplying them, that will impact their businesses. So you can kind of have this domino effect, and that can have huge impacts on communities. And those can be pretty difficult, particularly if they have a lot of space. Retailers use bankruptcy to get out of leases without having to pay large sums of money to the landlords. Which leads us to commercial real estate. Remote work plus online shopping have helped increase vacancies. Unlike home loans, commercial real estate mortgages typically range from five to 15 years. And across the United States, almost 1.5 trillion worth of commercial real estate debt is due before 2025. We're already starting to see some major real estate firms default on their buildings. The big impact for cities is the downtown central business districts. Another potential victim of mounting debt is healthcare, one of the most distressed industries in the U.S., in part because the sector's relative stability made it so attractive to private equity. Private equity goes in and buys these companies with debt, in part because they don't have to put up their own cash for it. They can basically transfer the debt to the company, but as a result, the company needs to be making enough profit, not just to pay off that debt, but also to have enough returns and lucrative returns for those investors. As of 2023, private equity owned 30% of the country's for-profit hospitals, which means these hospitals are forced to prioritize achieving sustainable profits instead of just focusing on community needs and public health. 
The tech industry has its own pressures, mainly because most startups are unprofitable and depend on cheap financing. The appetite for risk has declined a bit. There's less capital available to companies, particularly those that are growing. Higher rates make these new tech companies less attractive because investors want to see proof of profits immediately. Big companies respond by cutting jobs to reduce costs. Small companies struggle to raise funding. Typically, when a tech company goes bankrupt, it's a product failure. It's a technology or an idea failure. You know, it just kind of goes poof. Playing into the consolidation of tech and some other industries is the collapse of local lenders like Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, and First Republic. All were seized by the FDIC and had their assets sold off and their demise reduced credit availability. A daily battle is being waged in supermarkets all over this country. From the post-war economic boom in the 1950s to its high point in the 80s, interest rates have always fluctuated with the times. But the near zero rates of the last 15 years following the great financial crisis have hardly been the norm. The financial crisis was obviously unique in and of itself. This time around, banks are much healthier. When it's difficult to raise money, clearly many more companies are going to founder. Fortunately for companies on the brink, this time the fall doesn't seem quite so far. It's definitely not as dire as 2008. It's not even on the same scale. The problem is, when companies aren't put off by higher rates and keep borrowing, it may be a sign that the Fed still has more work to do to bring down inflation, which increases the odds that someone will get caught off sides and left to take the hit. And in Australia, unemployment and job applications. Well, we've got the ratio of seek job applications to job ads. We see the direction that's going, and unemployment's going to follow. In fact, my forecast is that we'll see uh, unemployment rise to around 5.5% in this cycle. And that is a lot worse than most Aussie economists are predicting. But then again, I'll share later in probably the next part of this video series why you shouldn't listen to any Australian economists, especially ones working at a bank. And the RBA exposes magic number for housing and banks Households are holding up reasonably well under the strain of high interest rates, but a rise in unemployment would cause real pain. And it's coming. It's coming. My forecast is for around 5.5% in this cycle. And if things actually get worse than I think, and there's you know, the possibility that it does, uh, all, all bets are off. And company insolvencies... Uh, they are rising, especially in the construction sector. You guys have probably seen the news that you know, construction companies are falling over left, right and centre, uh, and they're leading the way. Corporate insolvencies head higher from Coolabar Capital. Contrasting with the relative stability in the unemployment rate to date, national corporate insolvencies continue to trend higher, reaching their highest level since 2015 in August. By industry, construction insolvencies remain the standout where builders have been squeezed by fixed price contracts on existing projects and reduced demand for new work. Relatively high interest rates on corporate loans, about 5.5% on average for large businesses and 65 to 7.25% for small and medium-sized companies. And weak economic growth should see insolvencies trend higher next year. And here's a chart of... Total monthly corporate insolvency. So yes, it's coming off a very low bottom because remember, you could trade while insolvent during the <coughs> cough period. However, uh, the trend is definitely heading in the wrong direction for the Australian economy and for jobs. One in three big home builders are losing money, the RBA says. And for all those out there saying how great our economy is and house prices are just skyrocketing, you know, nothing can defeat house prices. Our economy's sick. Uh, Labour productivity, GDP per hour work is falling, and this is inflationary. Uh, so Australia, we've, and this is Australia, by the way, um, Australian data. We got an inflationary problem here in Australia. Interest rates have to rise, and that's going to be extremely painful on those that are in debt. 
those with big mortgages. And this is going to put pressure on the RBA. And in the next video, actually not the next video, the one after that, because I'm saving the best for last. In this video series, I'm saving the best charts for last, where it's going to be so obvious why I'm so bearish real estate, especially Aussie real estate. But our economy is sick. And we've seen private business investment as a percentage of GDP, whether it's for uh, mining or non-mining business investment, has just gone down and down and down. So once again, I'll share in, in, in our final video in this series where banks have been lending to, and they're not lending to businesses. And real wages. Well, look at this. When adjusted for inflation, you know, adjusted for CPI. How's this? Aussie, Aussie workers, you know, their wages are back to GFC levels, you know, 2008, 2009. So Aussie, Aussie workers have just been wiped out with CPI, with inflation. Our economy is sick. It is not producing... And we have produced a massive, massive debt bubble. Uh, and for those who think immigration is going to save us, wait for the next video. Because the next video is going to focus all on immigration. It's going to focus on the rental market, Airbnb, and what's likely to happen with all of that. And then in the final video of this series, I'm going to really let loose. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll see you in the next video. And just a reminder, the information provided in this video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on this channel constitutes as financial advice. The information in this presentation is no substitute for financial advice, and all investors should seek advice from a licensed financial advisor having regard to your own objectives, financial situation, and needs.